Welcome, everybody. Hi, hi. I can't understand why someone would want to hold an April Fair way up here in Maine <laughs> when we could have held it down in some nice warm place like North Carolina. But what we're talking about, farming at uh, the difficult part of the year, what I used to refer to as the other eight months, uh, you're going to get cold fingers and be chilly on some of those days, so this is a good chance to find out what it's like. That basket there holds the type of product that everybody would love to have in the middle of the winter. And none of these ideas are new. Uh, I've been fortunate to uh, travel to Europe to places where back 150 years ago, there were salads like that in the middle of the winter. And they were done by a technique that where the growers borrowed these glass bell jars from the physics lab. They were used in physics to extract air and, uh, and find out what was going on in a vacuum. And it was an enormous amount of handwork. You could get about five lettuces under each of those, but they were all hand vented. And some of these growers had 3,000 of those bell jars, and you can imagine the amount of work uh, putting the vent in during the day, but they were pretty technological. They could roll straw mats out over them at night, and it was amazing how much out-of-season production they got with that. These were sort of the first movable greenhouses. Then the technology moved from those bell jars into cold frames, and they put the cold frames on top of hotbeds, and hotbed is just where they have uh, put a pile of horse manure, two or three feet thick, and put some uh, soil on top of it. And then the heat from the decomposing horse manure allowed them to grow even melons and cucumbers out of season. Um, the thing I love was the, this was done in such intensive uh, areas that they had narrow paths between the growing beds, so, you, so narrow you couldn't get in there with a wheelbarrow. So this is how the manure was brought in. And they would fill those baskets with the uh, uh, either composted or fresh manure, depending on what it was being used for. And then the operator was sort of the human dump truck. He would just bend forward, and all of that would come out uh, uh, over your head and, and slide down that, uh, that higher spot. When I first went and visited growers in, in Europe, I saw a lot of operations like this where they were growing uh, through the winter in cold frames, very much like they had been doing hundreds of years before. And the best one of them was about eight miles south of Paris, the farm of Louis Savier. And this was, to me, the great eye-opener of my farming career. Uh, my notes from that day begin with one word, wow. I had never realized how well it could be done. It certainly wasn't being done that way in the part of the world where I lived. But Louis was a holdover from the old days, and he still grew with the old techniques. Uh, here he is with a... Uh, one of the frames filled with seedlings that were about to be put out. And it was just amazingly efficient, too. And back at the start, we were all told, oh, you can't grow on a small area. Uh, uh, it's just not efficient enough. And yet, what I saw on Louis's farm was just unbelievable efficiency. Uh, these people knew just what they were doing. They had rubber pants on because they were working on their knees. They had rubber bands with them to put around the bunches of radishes. It was just great to see. But the best part of it was how intensively they were farming. And this is a, a field, one of the field on Louis' farms the day I visited. And there are rows of spring onions. And uh, they are growing in between rows of corn salad or mosh, a popular winter salad. And it was, they would harvest, uh, the rows are just far enough apart that if, as you harvested the mosh, your feet fit between there, and then the onions were ready in the spring. 
And it was, again, it was a level of efficiency that I hadn't seen before. But the main thing people were telling us at the time was there was no way we could do anything like that because Europe was so far south on the globe uh, that they had uh, uh, you know, all this uh, uh, sun in the winter. Well, it turned out that Europe is far more north on the globe than we are in North America. And I am standing there on a little farm in Italy just outside of Genoa. And that farm is on the exact same parallel of latitude as I am in Maine. In fact, the city of Portland, Maine, is on the same latitude as the sunny beaches of Saint-Tropez in France. We now refer to ourselves as living on the sunny Atlantic coast of Maine. <laughs> Day length is determined by your latitude. And so we had the exact same day length as this wonderful little farm in the hills above Genoa. And we could do anything they were doing, and they were growing all winter long. So I've been experimenting with this for a number of years. In the early days, we built a, a copy of what the Europeans were doing with these uh, uh, wonderful uh, cold frames. Uh, this was on an experimental farm in Massachusetts. And we would plant uh, carrots around the middle of August, which is pretty late for Massachusetts. And then just before it got really cold, we would cover them with some straw. And then we would put glass frames over them. And this was all experimental at the time. We thought, well, maybe we're going to get snowed under. But that amount of snow wasn't too bad. But the fun thing about it was when we opened up the frames and we opened them up that first year to see what was going on on the 11th of February. And not only were there delicious carrots in there, but the straw had preserved their tops. And we sold these bunched. And it was amazing because that back then, before Whole Foods had taken over, there was a competitor in New England called Bread and Circus. And so we phoned them up and asked if they wanted some midwinter beautiful bunched carrots. And they said, yeah, we'll take them. And the next day, they called back and said, we'd like another 17 cases of those. <laughs> we said, sorry, guys, that was just a trial for now. But at least we know that we're on to something. We could also winter over uh, lettuces. And uh, they survived very under neat neatly under there and uh, matured. Uh, uh, in uh, about this time of the, of the year. And we said, OK, we got something here. This is really good. Of course, whenever you're pioneering new things, occasionally reality strikes. And you realize why no one has been doing this in Maine. <laughs> but we were not ready to give up. And we said, OK, there has to be an answer here. What if? What if we put our frames inside a little greenhouse. And then we don't get snow down our neck, and we can find them after heavy snows. And this was really the great leap forward. This was when we discovered the idea of double coverage, having a layer of protection inside the greenhouse uh, and the greenhouse itself. And so what we learned from this was that each layer of covering, that greenhouse is one layer and the cold frame is the second layer, each layer of covering moves the covered area about 500 miles to the south on the uh, east coast of North America. So outside that greenhouse, we were in Maine. The minute you walked into the greenhouse, you were in New Jersey, a place I can assure you, you only want to go metaphorically. <laughs> and when you reached your hand under the glass in that cold frame, your hand was in Georgia. Yeah. And this is pretty good for Maine. And what we did, we looked up the, the weather in the winter in February in Georgia. And it was exactly the type of low temperatures that our recording thermometers were giving us under the inner layer in this greenhouse. So that was when we figured, hey, we ought to be able to do almost anything. And if you look at this next picture, uh, there's a row of a bunch of little seedlings there. Uh, being the type who always wanted to do the impossible, we had always wanted to 
plant seeds on the 1st of January. So we planted those little seeds on the 1st of January. This picture was taken on the 10th of February. They are up and growing in a climate where nobody could believe it. And what this was the, the really key that that second layer made all the difference and, and moved us into a growing climate inside the greenhouse where we could really do anything, even in an area where it looks like this in the winter. Now, you guys have it a bit easier than, than we have. Uh, it, but I suppose if you decided to farm on the top of Mount Mitchell, it would look like this in the winter. So we have a few days like this. But for the most part, we have found that there's easy and very, very economical ways to do this. We replaced the cold frames very shortly after we figured out how to do this with just a, a floating row cover. And the beauty of floating row cover is you didn't have to vent it because this stuff is self-venting. And we lost a little bit of the temperature protection, but we found it didn't make much difference. And underneath that floating row cover uh, are the crops you want. This it, the, here happens to be a plant called Claytonia. It was also known for many years as miner's lettuce. And if you remember the gold mining in California uh, in the gold rush, uh, this Claytonia is a weed of the California mountains, and that's what the mountain miners found they could eat in the middle of winter. Uh, we were also growing European crops. Uh, this is that same mosh that I had seen in Louis Savier's field. Uh, we don't grow it anymore because it has one disadvantage. You notice I'm harvesting it there. You cut these whole little plants. They look beautiful in a salad bowl, but once you cut them, there's nothing there. And replanting in the middle of the winter is a slow process. What we wanted were crops that we could plant, say, about the uh, uh, 1st of October in your climate here and would keep producing in there all winter long. And the winner for that was spinach. Spinach is just the ideal crop for this. It is very cold hardy. And every time you go out and cut a spinach leaf, the spinach, because you planted it back when the days were long enough, back in, in September and October, it has a good root system. And it's putting out new, uh, new spinach leaves all winter long. Now, there are a bunch of other hardy crops that we grew and, and put in our salad mix. This is bull's blood beet. And that color, uh, that wonderful color, is our anthocyanins, which are good for people. And it turned out that they're even more intense in the cold weather. So we're actually, despite the fact that we were breaking all the rules, turning out uh, salads that were even more nutritious. This is a wonderful little uh, plant known as buck's horn plantain, because the leaves look like a, the rack on a buck. The best lettuces we found were the ones with thin leaves, uh, uh, like this red oak leaf. And then there were all the Asian greens. And the wonderful thing about Asian greens is they're not only cold hardy, and they're, they're heat resistant. So we tried everything in that uh, cornucopia. And we found one after another that they all loved what we were doing in uh, in the unheated, uh, uh, double-covered greenhouses. So you want stuff to do well. You want it to uh, taste good. But if you're working there all day, you also want it to be pretty. And we found that we could use very simple little cedars. Uh, it, they're in the Johnny's catalog. One puts in four rows at a time. Another one puts in six rows at a time. So you're getting 12 rows to a 30-inch bed. You have incredibly high production. And we were turning out fantastic baby leaf salads. But we were out there with a knife harvesting these things. And we are <laughs> talking at dinner last night about Band-Aids on small farms. And, when we got a new crew, there was an awful lot of Band-Aids being used. But we suddenly found we were in competition with California. And they had these huge bandsaw blade cutters that were going down the fields. And, and we were out there with knives. Well, we needed a tool that helped 
do it better. And this is a wonderful thing about the world we live in. There are a lot of people after the same game. And farmers are by far and away the most ingenious people I know. And a family from uh, Tennessee came up to see our winter operation. And they had their 16-year-old son with them. And I was fascinated at the moment because there was a 16-year-old with his own lawnmower repair business. And uh, he asked me the perfect question. He said, you do neat stuff with tools, Elliot. What have you failed at? And I said, yes. So I showed him all our failures to come up with a way to harvest baby leaf salad efficiently. And three years later, I got a phone call from him. And he said, Elliot, we got it. My dad and I are bringing it up to show it to you. And what he had done was solve the problems that we hadn't solved. If you look at that picture right down on the bottom next to the cut uh, uh, ends of the lettuce, there is a, a little blade, and it goes side to side, powered by that cordless drill. And the cordless, this is great. Mr. DeWalt has already invented all that, so we're just taking advantage of it. We had come up with that much of it, but when you pushed it against the light crop, it would push it over. And what Jonathan Deisinger figured out was that if you put that wonderful brush thing there that spins, it's like the ones that clean your car and the, and the car wash, as you went along, it would push the leaves back into the basket. And he has his own company, Farmer's Friend, making these things now. And this has been the greatest leap forward for people turning out baby leaf salads and wanting to compete with the big boys. So this is the product we were turning out. It had the bull's blood beet. It had a bunch of other, uh, some Italian uh, uh, endive in there, the spinach, the uh, uh, buckshorn plantain. And really, it was one of the best products anybody had ever seen. We, we could hardly grow enough of it. There was so much demand. The other crop that has been incredibly popular uh, are carrots that we leave in the soil and harvest from the cold soil all winter by moving a greenhouse over them so we, we can get at them. We plant these in our climate about the middle of August. Down here, you could probably wait until early October. What happens when you leave carrots in the cold soil rather than digging them and putting them in a root cellar is they continue to get sweeter. And whether it is because they're using the sugar as an antifreeze, that could be it. But we pull these fresh all winter, and these are our most popular crop. Parents in neighboring towns have told us that our carrots are the trading item of choice in local grade school lunch boxes. <laughs> if you have one of our carrots and you want that other kid's Tootsie Roll, you got it. Well, we wanted to distinguish these from root cellar carrots because it's important when you're marketing that you uh, make your crop unique. And so we learned to leave about an inch and a half of green top on there when we harvested them because the tops stay green under the inner layer. And this made just a beautiful uh, uh, pack, and they are known affectionately to all the young kids as candy carrots. We also wanted to get a jump on the spring. And one of my favorite foods when they come in are baby new potatoes. So we tried to figure out, OK, we can plant carrots the ones you just saw there, for our new crop, after we've harvested all the winter ones, we can plant those on the 1st of January. And even in our climate, we're selling new baby carrots by the first week in May. Pretty darn good. Could we do this with other crops? Could we do it with potatoes? So you see the seed potatoes there. We're pre-sprouting them for a month to get a good sprout on there. Uh, we put them in, uh, in beds in the greenhouse, uh, two rows on a 30-inch bed, kept them protected at night with the inner layer, and we were selling baby new potatoes on the 5th of May also. So the potential at both ends of the season here is pretty fantastic. But we wanted to be able to use our greenhouses not only to grow stuff in the winter, but in our cool coastal climate, about 2 thirds of the way up the main coast, we really needed those greenhouses to be able to ripen peppers, eggplants, and tomatoes in the summer. 
And so we decided we wanted a movable greenhouse so we could leave it over the summer crops until they froze out and then move it to the winter crops. And this is one of our earliest experiments, a couple of neighbors helping me there. Uh, that had a unique moving system, which we tried for a while and decided it wasn't as good as it could be. We then started making them with skids like this on the bottom, and that, well, that worked well, but we were always looking for better systems. And so this is what a greenhouse is looking like in the summer. You can see all those uh, tomato plants in there. And the field outside uh, has been prepared so we can plant winter crops on it. And once we get oh, probably the third week in, in October where we live, and it's an unheated greenhouse so the tomatoes finally freeze out, we just slide that greenhouse over and it's now a winter spinach house. The nice thing about this, if you understand economics, is you have an investment, a capital investment in that greenhouse, and now we have the advantage of actually getting double use out of that capital investment as if we had two greenhouses for the same price. So you get into the fall, we have multiple crops in the, uh, in the field ready to be covered, and we wait, as I said, until the crops that were in the greenhouse, like these cucumbers, uh, finally it's uh, too cold and it freezes them out, and we then open the bottom end of the greenhouse, the doors along the bottom there fold out, and that little figure in the, in the, the, between the door there, that's me on a, on a small tractor, and we can tow this house, down the field to cover those winter crops. This house is 30 feet wide and, uh, and 100 feet long. Uh, you can see this part of the farm from the road, and people driving by would always squeal to a halt because there's something the size of a small barn slowly moving across this field, which you don't normally see. Now, it, it's a little unnerving to think of something the size of a small barn suddenly being picked up and wafting toward you quickly on a stiff breeze. <laughs> so you want to make sure that when it's in place, you have it chained down. So we have chain binders and chains and 4,000 pound anchors on the corners to make sure that it doesn't move when you don't want it to. And you know, I get to this point in the lecture and people think, golly, this guy's amazing. He really, he doesn't make any mistakes at all. So I always show them this picture. <laughs> I have this blown up on the wall of my office and underneath it says, whoops. <laughs> so that was one we didn't have quite well enough anchored. So just, I put that there to remind you that uh, you gotta pay attention in this game. Um, the other advantage of movable greenhouses is that we can grow a green manure crop on the unused area and have the same soil beneficial uh, uh, improvements going on that I would have if this was just in the field, which you can never get in a greenhouse because you can't afford to take that expensive space and grow a, uh, uh, a green manure crop in there uh, uh, over the, the summer. Um, at one end of one of our greenhouses, we wash and pack produce. And we do that because even a pretty fancy plastic greenhouse can be built for about $5 a square foot. And if you've ever built a building, you'll know that $5 a square foot is, yeah, what, what can be built for $5 a square foot? So rather than building a separate building for washing and packing, it made sense to pour a concrete slab at one end of one of our greenhouses where we can wash and pack. Since we have to keep that area just above freezing so the water doesn't freeze and so we don't freeze when we're working in there in the middle of the winter, uh, we can then use the other end of that greenhouse, we've only using a quarter of it for the washing and packing, for slightly heated winter production. And I hope you can see that 
picture in this light, but the, the supposed walls on either leaning against the plastic on either side, that's about four feet of snow outside. This is in the middle of the winter. But one nice thing about greenhouse growing is maybe it's 10 degrees out and you're working indoors in a t-shirt, so it's pretty nice. The concrete slab at, at the near end of the greenhouse there where we have the washing and packing on one side of it, we put uh, uh, water pipes underneath it that we can pump warm water through, and so we have bottom heat for seedlings there. We're trying to make use of everything. So once you put a little bit of minimum heat in a greenhouse, all of a sudden you can do even more things in the winter uh, that wouldn't quite be up to quality if you did them in the totally unheated operation. And since that we have to have the heat in part of it to keep us from freezing, we use it very well. And so you can have nice lettuces. <laughs> you can continue uh, uh, right on through the winter with things like this uh, a uh, cut and come again uh, uh, Italian endive. This is sold, you can see on the stake there, it says Bianca. If you find that in the Italian catalog, it says Bianca Riscia d'Italia, which means white and curly by the leaf. And we work with a lot of restaurants. Restaurants love putting the name of the crop and the grower on the menu and all that, but somehow Bianca Riscia d'Italia was a little too much of a mouthful. So we're, we're good marketers. We changed the name of it to Golden Frise. With, we tripled the sales of that. This is the honest truth, by giving it a snazzy name that the restaurants loved. And so there are an awful lot of restaurants near us in Maine that put their lobster salad on a bed of golden frise now. Other crops that we found uh, worked well. Um, we were selling this for a number of years as our stir fry pack. And this bag has one uh, uh, hockeri turnip in there. It has one carrot, it had a leek, it had a, a Tatsoi, a shunkyu pink radish, and, and a pak choy in there. And this was great. These are all crops that played the game in our winter production. And from the point of view of selling and marketing, the, pe the people in the store could pick up this bag, and everything they needed for a stir fry was in that bag. So I recommend doing some sort of uh, uh, inventive thinking for your marketing, because it will make a big difference. So we try and turn out beautiful crops. Uh, we do our, our best. We can keep radishes go going all winter in the minimally heated house. Uh, we end with them in December and don't start again in, until March in the totally unheated houses. We can keep uh, parsley going all winter in the minimally heated house. And our very, very popular hockeri turnips we have a rule, especially in the uh, minimally heated house, that anything in there has to bring in a buck fifty a square foot every two months. And the reason we have a rule like that is because once you put heat in a greenhouse, you are on a slippery slope. Well, golly, you know, Elliot, you're keeping this at just 36 degrees. If we went up to 46, we could grow this. If we went up to 56, Next thing you know, you're North Carolina's largest mango grower. <laughs> and you've just signed in for chapter 11. So you really, you want to be careful about those things. So nice thing about the Hakurai turnips, you cut the tops off, you get beautiful turnip greens to sell. The bottoms are these delicious little turnips that are so tender you can eat them like apples. This was a good thing. But I need to mention, because the Hakurai turnips, beside being a favorite, of mine, a favorite of mine and a favorite of our customers, are also a favorite of small furry animals. And we have a lot of them. They're known as meadow voles. And meadow voles tunnel into our greenhouses. They chew up the fabric inner layer to make their comfy nests. They think we have created Florida for them. And this is, that we're the nicest people going. Well, we're not, 
the nicest people going. Uh, but we were having a hard time getting rid of these guys. And we tried every bait imaginable. And usually, the, the good bait, you'd get a vole or two, and then it wouldn't work anymore. And we were trying everything. Wild strawberry-flavored bubble yum worked really well for a while there. We, we got into a macadamia nut butter. We were looking for anything. But it turned out that the third vole that came along would go sniff, sniff, and say, uh-oh, last time I smelled that, Uncle Harry bought the farm. And they wouldn't go near the bait. So we said, OK, there has to be another answer here. What voles like to do is scurry into small, dark holes. So we created small, dark holes for them to scurry into. And we made these wooden boxes. And we drilled little mouse holes at either side of them. And we put totally unbaited traps in there. So the only smell in there, once the first vole went in, was vole. And these have been absolutely fantastically successful if you have any vole problems. And you just put them along the edge because they like to scurry along edges. And they see this little dark hole. And that's what they're programmed to go into. And this has been amazingly effective. As we've experimented with movable greenhouses, we've done all sorts of different designs. We had a design for a while where we had a wheel on the bottom of each hoop that rolled on a pipe lying on the ground. And these wheels and pipes are the exact same things you would see with a gate into an industrial park, a chain link fence gate, and the wheels roll on the horizontal pipe. These are the same things. This was a nice system. And you notice. You wonder if this thing's going to stand up. Well, we got it to stand up by just putting a, a, a better superstructure with, uh, with diagonals up in the, the top of the thing. But the trouble with it was that each of those wheels, depending on where we got them, was about 25 to 35 bucks a piece. And there were 26 of them under a 48-foot house, plus you had the cost of the, of the pipe. Well, we make all our decisions based on intelligent economics because we're trying to stay in business. Uh, that seemed like a poor use of, uh, of our capital to have it just sitting there uh, until the two or three times a year when we move the house. So we're into moving because you can see from this, we actually have areas where a greenhouse can move to four different plots. And one or two of them can be in green manures. Others can be in the winter crop that is growing during the summer or when we have to plant it. For example, if we're going to cover a bed of leeks, we put those out in, in May. And they're sitting there all summer. And that's why everyone told us, well, you can't possibly cover leeks with a greenhouse because you can't afford to grow them in the greenhouse all summer, which you can't. But if you have a movable greenhouse, you move it over them when they need it, and that works quite well. So we're, we said, OK, we've got to have an easier way to move a greenhouse. So we're going to have four spots, and we're going to move it a lot. So we worked with a, a company in uh, at Kansas City. And this is a V-track that lies on the ground. And those are uh, good industrial wheels with ball bearings in them. And we built a greenhouse on those. And of all the greenhouses, this is the easiest one to move. No tractor or anything. That's just two human beings pushing a, a, a 30 by 48 foot greenhouse down the track. But it had one serious flaw. This was the Cadillac of movable greenhouses. And it was far too expensive for a small farmer. These people sell a lot. The company that makes it sells a lot to estates. But, uh, most of us aren't running estates. So we said, this is a great thing, but we still have to make it more affordable. So we puzzled and puzzled and finally came up with our best way of moving greenhouses. This is a wheelbarrow wheel. And I will show you in the next picture that funny little frame it's on. Uh, my neighbor is a blacksmith, and that's made out of 3 quarter inch uh, rod. And you see in the foreground, one 
end of that has been inserted in a hole in the bottom of the greenhouse. And then the top part has been pushed down. And when you push it down, it raises the greenhouse a couple of inches off the ground. You lock that in place. And your whole greenhouse, this is a, a 30 by 48 foot greenhouse. You have 10 wheels, five under each side and you can move the greenhouse. Now those ended up costing me about $50 a piece, but we now move every greenhouse on the farm with this same set of wheels. So after you move the greenhouse, you detach them, you take them off, you store them inside, they're lasting forever. And this was by far and away the simplest way of, of doing it. The key was that to have those holes drilled in that bottom bar, five of them along each side, that you could put the wheels in and, and make it move. I just heard about a wonderful farm in Vermont where they'd been building uh, homemade uh, greenhouses, and they had their own ingenious way of moving it. They took cartwheels, and they put a wooden frame on them so they could lift up the bottom of the greenhouse put it on each of those, but this was the picture I loved. They could then move it with people power. Uh, you have to have a, a little three-year-old girl helping you to get enough muscle in there. But th this was just the, the height of ingenuity as far as I was concerned because small farmers need to do this sort of thinking if they're going to be figuring out how to run their farm and, uh, and make a living at the same time. The plans for a little greenhouse like that are in the Johnny's Selected uh, Seeds uh, website. And they have bending forms to show you how you can bend uh, pipe that you can buy at Home Depot to make a greenhouse like that about as inexpensively as, as possible. But we wanted to keep the expense down even more. And so we experimented around once we knew we could bend pipes with coming up with what we called quick hoops. And a quick hoop is made from a 10-foot length of, of metal electrical conduit, half-inch conduit. And you can bend it around a form. These things are very easy. And then you poke it into the ground, and it's covering two 30-inch beds side by side. Now, this is pretty neat. And down here, where you don't have the winter we have except today, uh, <laughs> You can probably grow all winter in those things. And if you do, you're going to want to protect them against winter wind. And so you can see that little end on this uh, is hinged at the bottom of the vertical uh, hoop there. And after you attach the plastic to it, you wedge it down, and it tightens the whole thing up and keeps it in place. But then. A friend had also figured out how he could harvest out of it all winter by making a roll-up side. And then this is pretty neat. You roll that up, you get inside there to harvest and put it back down. And, and the beauty of these things, and you can see it in this next picture, is three rows of quick hoops covers the same amount of ground as that uh, 21 uh, by 48 foot greenhouse. And I took this picture the first year we were doing overwintered onions. If we plant onions in uh, uh, the first of September in the right variety, we're harvesting them in, in the first of June because we can get them to overwinter if we protect them. The first year we protected them with the greenhouse and that was nice except the greenhouse wasn't making us any money during the winter. And so you can see those three rows of quick hoops next to it are covering the same space, and they're covering it for 5% of the cost of the greenhouse. So this was a great leap forward from the point of view of winter production. And you can see that just as well here. There's three rows of quick hoops, each covering two beds, and there's the greenhouse that would have been there. When we started using the quick hoops, and we wanted to roll a greenhouse over them and off of them, You'll see in that picture that we then put the crossbar at the end of the greenhouse about three and a half feet above the ground. So when we opened up the plastic at the bottom, we could slide the greenhouse over the quick hoops. 
Well, that made life a little awkward for a while because we used to have it down at 18 inches, and we could step over it when we went into the greenhouse. It's hard to step over a bar that's going across at three and a half feet. But one day, and it's amazing how stupid you get as you get older, I'm wandering along the greenhouse, and we used to be so ingenious, we always used to put the doors in the end of the greenhouse, and then when we started moving them, we made the door jam so they would fold up, and we made the door removable. And one day I'm wandering by, and I'm looking at the greenhouse, and I say, huh, why don't we just go in through the side? So we just put wiggle wire channel around one edge of the side there, and you can just undo that uh, four-sided odd piece of plastic there, walk through there, and you don't have to step over bars and everything. And since it isn't obvious that you can walk through the side of a greenhouse, uh, it took us an awful long time to figure that one out. <laughs> But we wanted to do even better. And we wanted to make greenhouses that were even less expensive and easier to move. And this is a, a, a pair of them out there. I think this year they were, they were growing a, a tomato plants. They have on the, this end of them what we call scissor doors. And the plastic from the left and the right is attached to either one or the other of those two poles. And they hang down in the middle, and then when you want to vent or walk in, you can just swing them like one blade of a pair of scissors. The beauty of it is you have an almost no cost end wall on the end of a greenhouse, but you can also fold them out in, like in this picture, and you have full ventilation. Well, if you take the plastic off of that thing, you can then move that because that isn't one greenhouse. That's made out of four little homemade sections of greenhouse. And two people can carry those across a field and line them up and get them ready to be covered again. So this was by far and away the, the simplest and least expensive uh, movable greenhouse we've ever used. We do grow a lot of leeks in the winter, and we've covered them with very, very simple greenhouses, just a couple of uh, metal poles in the form of an A-frame here. But everybody said, well, yeah, but there's no way you can cover leeks with a greenhouse because you have to put them so far apart so you can get in between there with the tractor to hill the soil up around them. Well, I have a lot of smart friends in Europe who said, no, no, don't do anything like that. Just make a hole in the ground about nine inches deep, grow your leek seedlings so they're 10 inches tall, and just drop the leek seedling into the hole. And when you first see this, you can't believe it's gonna work because there's nine inches of that plant down underground there, but it does work. They grow up out of there and you get beautiful leeks uh, that you can now afford to cover with a greenhouse because you have so many of them. You have three rows to the bed. And when you harvest them, they have a beautiful nine inch, beautiful blanched shank that you haven't done any further work on. And all of these greenhouses were planting very efficiently and, and intensively with cedars. Yeah, even on an organic farm, the seeds don't come up quite that quickly. That's just to, 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 <laughs> To show you that, that that's the, the spacing, these are two and a quarter inch apart rows. It's a very inexpensive little tool. It's from the Johnny's catalog. We wanted a more professional one, and we, we built one that did six rows at a time like this and smoothed it. But the reason you want to use uh, tools like this is the space in the greenhouse you paid a lot of money for, and you want it to be as productive as possible. And so a crop like carrots, we have 12 rows of carrots on a 30-inch bed. And years ago, I was lecturing in Pennsylvania, a bunch of field growers, all with about 20, 25 acres. And they said, how can you possibly make a living on an acre? And I said, well, uh, how many rows of carrots do you put on a 30-inch bed? And they said, three. And they said, well, I'm putting 12. So you got to multiply my one acre by four. And how many crops a year are you getting? 
And they said one. Well, I said, I'm getting three crops a year, so now you're going to multiply by my four acres by three. I got 12 acres. Well, basically, this is what's going on with small-scale production. You need to think that way in a greenhouse. If you're going to plant carrots that close together, you have to make sure you have weeds under control. And the best way to do that is to realize that carrots take at least seven or eight days before they come up. And your small weeds are going to come up in three to five days, especially the troublesome ones. So what you do is you plant your carrots. And just before the carrots come up, you go over the bed with a flame weeder. This is known as pre-emergence flame weeding. And it takes very little heat because all you're doing is just melting the protein cells slightly in the leaves of the baby weeds that are up. And it only takes about uh, 65 degrees centigrade to do that. Now, people, you know, everybody has this thing about weeds, and you want to burn the little buggers to a crisp. If you do, you're going to be spending a lot more propane than it takes. And after a while, you learn that this is a pretty neat way to go about things, pre-emergence flame weeding. The other key for winter production is succession sowing. So this picture and the next two pictures were all taken on the exact same day. This greenhouse had been planted first. This greenhouse was due to come in a month later. And this greenhouse was due to come in a month after that. And this is the, the key. You have to understand that when you're growing in the winter, it isn't as easy to say, oh, yeah, I need to plant more of that. Because once you get into winter and you have the short days, growth is really slow. So you have to have planted ahead at intelligent times that are going to make it all work. And of course, the thing that makes it all work is not that old guy, but the stuff he's holding, compost. And this is just fantastic that the world's best fertilizer is made in your backyard from waste products. I mean, obviously, Mother Nature wants us to be fed. And the best tools are simple also. So this is a broad fork. This is the best way to uh, uh, put air in your soil. And where you're using crop after crop, you want to make sure that you have air in the soil. Air is the least expensive ingredient you have, and it will help break down the roots of the previous crops so the next crops can grow. Simple tools. This is an Austrian hay rake. The Johnny's catalog sells that. It just happens to be 30 inches wide, and it fits the bed. But we wanted a, a tiller for the greenhouses. And obviously, it had to be an electric tiller. And so this is now called the Tilfer. Um, I was lucky to find an out-of-work engineer who wanted a project. And I got him to go into business and make these. He sells them through the Johnny's catalog. But the key is that everybody in their garage has a cordless drill. And Mr. DeWalt has already figured out all the, the secrets here. So you just run a cord around the trigger of the drill and up the handlebars. This is high tech. The tilter is designed to be run with the cordless drill, but it's designed for a lot of other things. It only goes two inches deep. And there's a reason for that. You have only the cordless drill to run it. But weed seeds that are in the soil more than two inches down never hardly germinate because they know they're not going to be able to make it up through two inches to get to the sun to keep on growing. So if you're working in a greenhouse and you're trying to eventually get the weeds under control, you don't want to be bringing up new weeds from down below. And if you use the tilther and you're only cultivating that top two inches, you have a much better chance of keeping it weed free. You also want to be efficient when there are weeds. And so we've been designing a hose. This is a wonderful little thing. It's in the uh, Johnny's catalog uh, called the wire weeder. But you notice I'm walking forward with it. And I'm holding that hoe as if I'm a tractor. And that's one of my cultivators. And so if you have the proper angle in the blade of a hoe, you can stand in a comfortable position. You notice that's a comfortable position. I believe that's the ballroom dancing position, if you think about it. 
not a bad position to be working in in the garden. If you use efficiency like that, you're really going to be getting places. So this is just another picture of that big, beautiful greenhouse. And I put it in here because if you have the ability to grow neat crops, people are going to be say, oh, the restaurateur comes up and says, Elliot, do you think you could grow a, a so-and-so for me and have it ready by the such and such date? Well, if they did that, I would say no. But they figured me out. They come up and say, well, yeah, you may think you're good, but I bet you couldn't get peas by the 15th of March. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean I can't? <laughs> well, we had peas by the 15th of March for this guy. But because we're trying to stay in business, we pay attention to what it costs us to grow things. And I would have had to have gotten $9 a pound for these peas to have paid for the time and space they took up. So if you're trying to figure out how you're going to keep from going broke at this game, and it really is fun when you have a greenhouse, you want to be paying attention to that. Now at the start, I showed you some slides of uh, the places I saw in, in Europe uh, growing with cold frames and Louis Savier's close planting. And I was over there uh, the last time when I saw this, it was 1996. And a lot of the stuff I'd seen in the earlier years had disappeared. So the farms that used to have all just more cold frames than you could imagine everywhere, when I went back to them, all the cold frames were, I guess the best word I can use for this is composting. They were no longer using them. The wood was rotting. But that was because they had replaced them with a new system. And every one of these farms now had a tractor that was putting, it put down the little wire hoops and then stretched and buried the, uh, the plastic over them. And this was an area around Nantes in, uh, on the western coast of France. And the whole countryside looked like a large chenille bedspread. In fact, the French name for these small tunnels is chenilles, because uh, it's the word for caterpillar. They look like caterpillars. But the thing I thought was most delightful, a friend and I who had been traveling with me looking in there, if you looked in there, what you saw was the same thing I'd seen in Louis Savier's field years earlier. You saw mosh, and in this case, carrots, alternating under there. And they were going to harvest the mosh when they took off the, uh, the, the cover and the carrots were there. And so even though they had moved on to a far more mechanized way of production, they were still uh, using a lot of the old time techniques. And the other thing you need, of course, is two very well-dressed people who were stupid enough to want to freeze to death all winter long. Uh, harvesting delicious food to feed their neighbors. And I hope there are a lot of you who want to do the same thing. And I thank you very much.